uh, I'm excited. Today is a big day for us as a church, and it's kind of the culmination of a uh, been a big year uh, for me. How many of you have had like the best year of your life? Would you raise your hand? A couple of you. That's awesome. How many of you have a tough year uh, in parts? Can anybody raise your hand? I'm more on that side of the camp this year. Been a little bit tough here and there, but at the same time, I got a lot to praise God for. God has been good to us, and uh, I'm going to share with you today uh, something called the, uh, a blessed future because I think God wants to do something really great in uh, your individual life, and he wants to do something in our uh, church life as a family. So are you with me on this today? It's going to be a good time. I want to start with a scripture that King David wrote. He was one of the kings of Israel, and he, he would write songs, and one of the songs that he wrote It carried this uh, phrase that really struck me as I was reading the Bible uh, earlier in the week, uh, and well, actually probably a week and a half ago, this line just stood out for me, and I felt like it was apropos to our church for today and for this year, and I'd like to read it to you. It's on the screen. It says this. David writes this about God. He says, God, you crown the year with a bountiful harvest, and even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Come on. Some of you have had some hard pathways, right? But this year... At the end of the year, God crowns it, and he says, okay, at the end of this race, I'm putting a crown on it, and I'm going to crown you with blessing, and I'm also going to let even the hard places overflow with abundance. Come on, that's a great, great thing. Uh, I want to start off reading a quote to you from a book I just read by uh, Pastor Mark Batterson, and he uh, writes this about faith. And, uh, you know, to be in church and to follow Jesus, it takes faith, and we're people of faith, and we live by faith. And we've got to have faith that God exists and that God sees what we're going through. And he's getting us to the next place he wants us to get to in life. Are you with me on that? Mark Patterson has this great quote on faith I'm going to read to you. He says, many people hit a dead end in their dream journey because they're waiting for God to go first. In my experience, signs follow. If you wait for God to part the Jordan River, you're going to be waiting the rest of your life you got to step into the river and get your feet wet before God will part the river. Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second step. Now, I just want to pause on this quote here and say, come on, this is like some of our life. Sometimes God doesn't show you the whole journey ahead. He'll just give you the next step. And you got to take a step of faith and go, yes, sir, I'll do that. And as you step in, in faith, and sometimes it's almost like stepping out over the ledge God puts the next step there, and he expects us to live by faith even when we can't see our five-year plan coming together. Come on, right? And we're people of faith. And here's how he ends this quote. He says, faith, taking that first step before God reveals the second, gratitude is thanking God after he does something. But faith is thanking God before he does something. And come on, we're going to be people of faith who are thanking God not only for what he did in our past, but what he's going to do in the future and we're going to go forward in faith. I've had a, uh, a really good time uh, the last year uh, learning how to write some things down. And I want to share with you how God has worked the faith journey in my life with me through uh, a little bit of journaling. How many of you uh, write in a journal? Can I just see by raise of hands how many of you? I started doing that uh, a little bit. And I would encourage some of you to uh, who have not done it, which is the majority of us, to maybe begin to write some things down There's a power in writing down and journaling things. I I write down things that God speaks to me in prayer. Sometimes a scripture I'll read will stand out to me, and I'll put that, I'll copy and paste that into my notes app on my phone. And uh, sometimes different things will happen. Somebody will pray for me and go, man, I feel led by God to share this with you. And they'll say some words that I go, man, how did you know that's what I'm going through? And they were just praying. I write those things down. Sometimes writing things down help you get through the dark hours. Sometimes when you're writing things down, they help you get through today, through the night, because you can look back and go, what did God say to me about this? There's a power in uh, writing things down, and even in the Bible, uh, God speaks to one of the Old Testament prophets named Habakkuk, which if you're going to have a baby soon, I I recommend not naming your child Habakkuk, (laughs) which is hard to say, but anyway, just free advice at New Vintage Church. But Habakkuk in chapter 2, this is what it says. Uh, he's, Habakkuk's writing, he says, Then the Lord said to me, Write my answer. Now, this is God talking to Habakkuk. Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. 
this vision, and this is where God knows us as humans. This is how God is telling Habakkuk why he should write down. The vision's for a future time. It describes the end. It will be fulfilled. But if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Come on, when God says, I'm going to do something, it gets done. When God starts something, he finishes it. He never leaves us hanging. He never leaves something open-ended. God's good that way. Can I get an amen if you believe that? He is faithful to complete things to their end, and especially if he makes a promise. And sometimes he'll say this. I want you to write this down because it may seem like a long time, and you're going to think I gave up on you, but I didn't give up on you. You're going to go back and read that I told you to be patient because sometimes when God gives you a promise for your family, God gives you a promise for your life, he's going to build something in your character and finally get you settled in an area. Sometimes it seems like it takes a long time for God to come through. But he's not slow. We're just, uh, we like everything fast. We want everything right now when we pray. But God's faithful. And I love that he said, write that down. There's another place in the scriptures where the guy, King David, who wrote that opening scripture that I read to you about how he crowns the year. David also writes another verse that God inspired him to write in that same book of songs. And he says this, let this be recorded or written down for future generations. So that a people that are not even born yet will praise the Lord. And let me just say this. Everybody in this room, you're sitting next to a great story. Somebody, come on, elbow somebody. And some of you might go, hey, you're a good looking story. If you're married and you're doing that to somebody that's not your spouse, you shouldn't be doing that. But come on, (laughs) you're sitting next to a story. Come on, our lives tell a story. And we always think our story is not that powerful, not that big a deal. Somebody else's story is powerful. But I'm telling you that sometimes what God's trying to do in your life, the story he's trying to write inside of your life, it's not even for just you. He's trying to write your story for the generation coming after you. There are people watching your life, knowing that you're a person with faith in Jesus Christ, and they're being inspired. And you might go, man, I'm just battling it through. It's been a rough year. It's been walking down the hard pathways. But man, somebody's watching your life and going, man, if they can make it, Maybe I can make it. And David captured this, and he said, record this. Write down what you're going through for people who aren't even born yet. Come on. Some of us need to get our life and go, I'm going to really submit every area of my life to God this year because I want my kids and my grandkids to know that God can help somebody when they cry out to him. Sometimes our story is not just about us. It's for the people coming after us. I want you to think about the church you're building you're sitting in. How many of you like coming to church here? The rest of you, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, we're about 60%. That's okay, I guess. Some of you are just sitting there like, keep going, preacher. All right, listen, I'm, I like this church too. I'd come here, and uh, I'm glad that we, you know, when we got into this building in 2012, we didn't own any chairs. I have a picture of all of us sitting on uh, lawn chairs we had to bring in for our first couple services. We forgot, because we were in, doing church in a movie theater, we forgot that places don't automatically come with chairs. So I got some of their big old Budweiser, you know, NASCAR sitting there, you know, uh, their lawn chair, and I'm like, this is church. This is awesome. And, but come on, somebody in, a, in days before us invested something so we could be here today. And some of the things that we're going to do today in our lives are going to have impact in the years to come for people that are coming after us. And I think it's brilliant that God does that. Man, I, I, I really have enjoyed writing some things down. I have a, in, my, in my phone, I have a couple different notes that I keep, and I have a journaling app that I'm not real faithful to, but I try to write some things down, and I keep track because I'm telling you, There's been moments where I go, God, did you really say that? It seems so impossible because I'm sitting in front of a circumstance in my life that it feels like what you said is absolutely impossible even for you. I don't know if you ever faced something like that. But man, when I go back and I either read the scriptures that God gave me, I read the prayers that I prayed, I read the things that happened, it gives me courage to go, be patient, wait for it, what God's going to do. He might seem like it's going slow, but hang on. I will fulfill it. I'm telling you, writing has a powerful, powerful thing. Some of you need to start writing some things down for the coming year that you want God to do or things that God said to you, and it'll help you. I'm going to go through some of my journal today over the last four years. You're going to hear my whole life story. You'll be here for a couple hours. 
Uh, no, I'm just going to hit some highlights. And I, want, I picked out some of the highlights from the last four years that have to do with us as a church and me as a person. And I think you'll relate to this. It's because this is your church as much as it's my church. It's really Jesus' church. But you know what I'm saying. It's our, it's our church. In uh, 2012, we were still in Carmike Movie Cinema. Would you raise your hand if you went to church at least once there? Yeah, all right, a few of you. That was, those were some fun days. And uh, we were in that movie theater, and I had crossed paths with Pastor Frank DiMazio from Portland at a pastor's conference. And he started asking us questions at the same Starbucks that we were sitting at. He came and sat by us. How many people are going to your church? How big is the building? And we're in the theater. And what are you doing about this? And have you looked at a building? No, we haven't looked. He says, Matt, I feel led by God to tell you this. Get into a building right away. You can do it. I said, I don't know how to read a lease paper or anything like that. He goes, they're not that complicated. Get into a building and you'll double in attendance in a year because God's moving in your church. And I said, oh, wow. So I wrote that down. I mean, when a man of God that you trust says, get into a building, you go, well, I ought to consider that. And so I did. I went back this week and I looked at our numbers. When we were in the movie theater, right before we uh, got into this building, so he talked to me in April. We got into this building in August. And in those several months, uh, our average attendance at the movie theater was about 200, 220 people. The year later, I went back and checked our records for how many people were coming to our church. And we had just started to crest the 400 mark and had hit as high as 444 people on a weekend. I thought, wow, come on, what God says, he ends up doing. Is, is that just true or what? Come on, God's good that way. Here's a, a thing from July of 2013. So this is now a year later. I got inspired in one of my prayer times and I journaled this. And I just want to read to you what I journaled that God was putting on my heart. Can one of you grab me um, a Kleenex from one of the boxes underneath? Uh, I'm, I'm like a puppy dog and my nose is always wet. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I'm more trained than my dog Kenobi. I just want to say that. <laughs> He almost has been killed several times because it's so cold outside. He's had to come in the house. Can I just tell you, we are not an in-the-house kind of dog family, but this is not confession time. I'll talk about my dog and my problems later. I need to journal that. Okay, back to this. July 2013, here's what I wrote when I felt inspired. The vision of New Vintage Church is to build a church that's centered on Jesus and that would touch all kinds of people and would eventually reach cities. I believe that God spoke this to me clearly and I risked everything to come and start this church. And God has been faithful. And then I wrote down a scripture that God gave me when I was back in Vancouver. It's from Deuteronomy. The Lord, your God, will bring you soon into the land that he swore to give to you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a land with large, prosperous cities that you didn't build, houses that are richly stocked with goods that you did not produce. You'll draw water from cisterns that you didn't dig. And you'll eat from vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant. When you've eaten your fill of this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. And can I just say about that scripture that, come on, sometimes God's going, I'm going to bless you so good, I'm going to give you stuff that you didn't even work for. I'm going to give you wells of water that you didn't have to dig. I'm going to give you influence in cities, and you didn't even help start that. Come on, this was a promise to, that God gave to me when we moved here. This was the scripture, the first scripture I got. And I wrote that down, and I want to say this, that God is good and he's faithful. And I continued to write in my journal that day, and I wrote this. Cities. I see cities. What could happen in the future? I see growth. I see more services. I see more buildings. I see Pasco having a new vintage church in it. I see Kennewick having one. I see our band recording songs. I see some of my team preaching amazing sermons. And I see hundreds of people coming to know Jesus at our church. This is back in 2013. I, you need to know that these things kind of burn in my soul. These are moments that God had just awakened my, my heart and my ears to him. And it was like, I have to write this down. And these were things that God has been faithful to bring to pass. I want you to jump ahead with me to September 2nd, 2014. This happened to be the time we had our very first building committee meeting. So we get into this building in 2012, and we had a four-year lease. And uh, halfway through, we thought, we better start thinking about the future. Our church had grown. We had started to add services. And this is our very first uh, uh, building committee meeting. And this is the opening paragraph on the sheet I handed out to the team that has been helping us think through what do we do 
uh, for the building. And this is what it says. We want to have a church that's all about Jesus, people, and the Tri-Cities. Our goal is to help share the gospel with everyone in Tri-Cities. We want to allow for growth in whatever way is most strategic and spirit-led to accomplish this. Come on, we want God's strategy, and we want him to lead us by his spirit. And this has been our goal. And I hope you're hearing a theme here that our church is about Jesus first, whatever makes him happy. You might be a Christian in here today, and in, in really in some ways, I don't care a whole lot what you think about our service. Now, I want you to come back and like it, but really that's not my primary goal. You might not be a Christian and be in here today, and you might kind of like it, but I really did not build it for you either, per se. I'm trying to build a place that when Jesus shows up, he likes it because there's a slice of all of humanity that gathers here. And man, when I read the Bible and see the houses that Jesus visited, he goes to Matthew's house. He goes to Zacchaeus' house. And there's people with bad reputations, and there's religious people, and there's every uh, ordinary Joe there. That's where Jesus likes to hang out. And our church is going to be a place where Jesus is happy first. Jesus first, and then we'll do what Jesus loves, which is touching people. And we believe by God's grace, he's going to help us to touch the Tri-Cities. All right, 2015 in August. Next journal entry I want to read to you. Uh, it says this, on this Tuesday, I feel some good and some not so good. And then I deleted out a whole bunch of stuff that you don't get to know what I wrote in my journal because it's private. It's my journal. But I want you to know that uh, my journal is not all miracles. It's not all awesome and positive. Come on, when you start to journal, you, you've got a lot of stuff that goes into that journal in life. Am I right? You don't have to yell at me, but you can. But I mean, right? You're just... Some life is not just miracles every day. It's pretty average, pretty normal. And I have some good days and I have some bad days. But here's what I wrote. I have some, feel some good and not so good. We just had a powerful weekend with Jonathan and Ray Dean Owens. The word that they preached was about faith. And it was very effective because that's their life message. They truly are people of faith. On the downside, there's still the pressure that I really feel on several fronts. One is the building that we don't see an answer for yet. And which way to go. And J.O. even gave us in the service a prophetic word that heaven says it's a green light, go. And I wrote in my journal, ha, 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 great, go where? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a real man of faith too, you know. So, man, I got to tell you, man, it was, a, it was a great weekend. And they're saying, man, come on, God's for you. Heaven's giving you a green light. And then I remember Ray Dean says, this is the scripture God has for this church. You speak to the mountain, grace, grace. And I just remember that next day feeling very discouraged, going, God, if you go on green light, open up a door. What do we do? Can't seem to get the building people to answer us back. We don't know whether we should build somewhere, go somewhere else. Maybe we should quit. All those become options when you're frustrated, right? And I was going, God, come on. You're toying with me. You're saying, it's a green light. I got no answers. And I was frustrated. And yet, I knew that God was trying to do something, trying to encourage me along the way. <laughs> August 27th, two days later, 2015, this is what I wrote in my journal. So Bob McGregor called me today. I had a couple uh, eldership things to cover with him. He starts the conversation giving me his feelings about the building scenario. He feels that our current location is the right fit. It's a good place for us and that we should attempt to buy it and stay there. And then I said, praise God for some input and direction. i like, man, out of the blue, my pastor who prays for us, one of the elders on our board, who was the founding, you know, he started City Harvest Church that we came out of. He says, man, I've been praying for you, and I feel that you should stay here and try to buy this building. And I'm going, we are trying. You know, we're trying, but it's, nothing's happening. And, but I thought, okay, good to hear another man of God give us some encouragement. September 2nd, 2015. I was frustrated this day, and this is all that's in my journal. God is for us regarding our building. Grace, grace. Can I just tell you that sometimes all you can do is quote a scripture when you're down and out. Like that, all you can do is go, God, life seems bad, but I know you're good. And I just had to go through some days where I'm going to go, I can't see the future because there's a mountain in my way. And God, you spoke to me about the other side of the mountain. I'm so close to this one and what's going on in my life. There's no way it seems like the circumstances that even you told me about are impossible for you to accomplish. And God's saying, man, you need to speak to the mountain and say, grace, grace. And so I had to have moments where I would just go, God, I can't see the future. 
But grace, grace. I'm going to believe what you said. Grace, grace. Some days that's all you can do is speak to the mountain that's in your life. And go, man, I, I'm going to get through this somehow, some way. It might not be today. God might come through tomorrow. It might be next week. But I'm going to say, God, I speak to this mountain. Grace, grace. Let your grace move the mountain. Get me over the mountain. Take me around the mountain. Dig me a tunnel through the mountain, but get me onto the other side. And that's how life is for us. And this is how I've been journaling, just walking it out. October 19th, 2015. I'm at this prophetic assembly church meeting at Life Church in Centralia today, and Pastor Jess, another pastor friend of ours, tells me that he feels strongly that what God is going to do is he's going to give us property, buildings, and that I should go knock on some doors. And I'm thinking, man, my knuckles are bloody from knocking on doors, like my little stubs. Okay, please, you know, like what do I do? But I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. You need to know this. That's the third man of God who's come in and not known our scenario and spoken to me and said, I believe God's spirit is speaking to me to tell you God's going to give you buildings. And after the first time, I was like, well, that would be neat if that happened. The second time I went, that's kind of a coincidence that maybe God might do that. The third one who said this to me, I went, I think God's serious. He's trying to get my attention from men from all over the country don't know our scenario. Maybe God is going to give us buildings. And I went, all right, better journal that down there too. January 19th of 2016, I feel personally we've turned a corner as a church from the fall. I have a fresh sense of the wind of the spirit at my back, and we are going forward. We have a meeting for this building at the end of the week. It could be an open-door miracle for us to move through. Had a little bit of faith. Maybe God's starting to shift the thing just a little bit, and maybe God's going to do something. March 8th, Sunday After the youth conference, some individuals came to me very excited, and they are going to make a large donation to our building fund. We didn't even we don't even really have a building fund going because we don't know (laughs) what building we're gonna buy. But they're like, we just believe God's gonna do something, so we want to sow into this. Uh, We have uh, I don't know the total yet, but the uh, words a hundred thousand were floated my way. Also today, Tuesday. We sent off an official letter to AGM, that's who owns this property, to purchase this building and the two parcels for $1.1 million. They are asking $1.5 million. It would be for the property that the church sits on and all the way out basically to the street. And uh, I wrote in my notes, boom. You just That's how I write in my journal. <laughs> boom. All right? March 8th. Starting to feel a little bit of courage. Somebody said, I think we might be able to give you $100,000 for your building. And we wrote an offer and sent it across because they asked us for one. And I'm going, okay, God, I'm still on the mountain, in front of the mountain. Are you going to get me over the mountain, through the mountain, to grandmother's house we go? Like, how is this going to happen? <laughs> March 25th. This is the heart of our church. And I want you to know my heart, it's not about buildings. It's about reaching people. But this is what was exciting uh, to me on that day, getting ready for Easter today actually been getting ready for a while now. The stage is turned. The paint is on. The carpet patch goes in today. It's going to be a crazy good Easter. Lots of invites have gone out. You all remember when the stage is on that wall? And we got this remodeled for Easter, had record crowds. And man, I'm telling you that our heart is not about the building, except that God is building people. And if people want to keep coming, our heart as a church, we've said this, We're going to make room, add services, do something, because if people want to come and hear about Jesus, we're going to keep finding ways to get that to them. And so sometimes that begins to involve a building. Sometimes it doesn't matter. I remember being at the Carmike Movie Theater and saying to our church, hey, it doesn't matter if we have church in a tent outside. Like if God shows up, if people's lives are transformed and people are learning about Jesus, that's what it's about. And that's still what it's about. And sometimes God Threads in uh, buildings for us to, to work with is part of that. Jumping ahead to March, uh, October 7th, October 7th and 8th. I've gone through some things this year. Uh, for me, some of this year has not seemed to be crowned with the glory and abundance of God. Sometimes it seems like it's the other half of that verse where David says, the hard pathways. And so for me this year, it seems like there's been some hard pathways to walk down. 
been some rough patches. It's been some spots where I went, man, I don't know if I can keep going on this journey, God. This is not as easy and fun as it once was. And I don't know if you can relate to moments like that, but that was the kind of year I had. And so I remember just praying in, uh, in October and going, God, the things that I've been, I feel bruised. I, I don't have a better way to describe it, but the pain of things that happened in the first and second quarter of the year were hanging on like a dark cloud. And even though they were in the past, I felt the weight of that. I, I hope I'm talking to people that can relate to this, but maybe some of you have had it, just you walk on water. But for me, man, I'm walking on a hard path, right? And I'm just going, God, I feel the weight of this. I began to pray and God began to lead me back to journaling for the second major time in my life. And he said, I want you to write down all the difficult things that happened this year. This is what I said in my prayer time. I'm like, you don't have enough paper for me to write it all down. Like that's how, you, how I felt, you know, was, God, there's been so much negative. And laying in my bed that night, got my phone out and said, all right, going to do it. Started to type out, this happened. Then this happened. I wrote all these things out, 16 different pretty major things. And I remember looking at that and going, that's some stuff right there. That's, those are some big ticket items. Would have taken out a lesser man. You know, any one of those. And started to give me a little courage, put a little distance between the, the pain of, of the feelings of it and see it on paper and going, I feel this way because some bad things did happen. But you know what? I thought it was pages and pages. It was just 16 big things. And the Lord began to speak to me in the same time frame. He said, now I want you to write down all the good things, all the blessings that happened in this year. I'm like, all right, Lord, I know what you're doing, messing with me, you know, and started to write down the highlights of 2016. I wrote down things for our church that God did, like it was really kind of a big investment and a miracle that the building owners let us move the stage here and take out the big wall thing here and all that. I wrote that down. There was other things that happened. God brought some of you into our church in this year, and some of your names are on the list. And, and, and then I wrote down the number of people that have given their lives to Jesus this year in our church. And I started to get excited. I went back through my picture roll on my phone and started seeing all the stuff God did in our family. And uh, I wrote down that Austin and McKenna finally got engaged. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited for this. So, uh, so that was number one on McKenna's list. It was like number 39 on mine. No big deal. I was thankful. Just wasn't as important to me. But I, I started writing down how uh, just different things that for my kids' lives and start writing down how we, our whole family got to go to a Portland Trailblazer game together on our spring break because somebody gave us money to go on a vacation and we went and we got to go to Porcano Tacos. If you don't know, you don't know, but I'm telling you, it was like heaven. And then we went from Porcano Tacos to the Portland Trailblazers and it was a night from heaven. And I just started to write down all the blessings and all the miracles and all the things that happened. At the end of that, man, I'm crying going, God, you have been so good to me this year. And I had 16 items on the negative list. I had exactly 64 on the positive list. And I said these words, but I didn't mean them. I said, Lord, I'd go through another year like that if I could have a year like this. But I didn't mean that. I didn't want to go through that again. <laughs> but can I tell you that sometimes we focus in on the pain of the bruise instead of the looking at the, and, and you know, really pondering the goodness of God in a year. I'm telling you, God doesn't leave things open-ended. He closes the circle. He crowns the year with goodness. He'll take you through a bad season, but he won't leave you out there. He'll bring you back around again. There's pain, there's death, there's loss, there's struggle, there's addiction, there's character flaws and failures, but I'm telling you, God doesn't leave you out there. He brings you back around because God is not unfaithful like we are. He's faithful. So I began to write those things down, and man, I just, it did something healing in my soul. I'm telling you as a church family, I, I think some of you need to, you need to crown the year. You need to write it down. You need to be like Habakkuk and record this. You need to be like David and write the things down for the next generation and say, man, I went through some things, but God brought me through. And years down the road, when you're hitting a dark patch, something you never thought you'd face, you'll go back and you'll read that and go, God got me through that moment. He can get me through this moment. And it'll build faith in you. I'm telling you, God's got a blessed future for you as an individual. If you'll follow him with your whole heart, he'll lead you through the tough times. 
and he'll get you onto the other side of the mountain. And he's got a good plan and a blessed future for us as a church at New Vintage Church. I'm convinced of that. I, uh, for a while there when we started this church, I was like, God, I'm doing this out of obedience. I don't know how it's going to go. But man, I'm convinced at this point that God is not short on dumping miracles out in people's lives. I've had the privilege over the last couple weeks and months to sit down with lunch and have coffee and breakfast with men and women from this church. And I'm telling you, I'm convinced God is transforming people here. God is doing a work in individuals' lives and bringing people into better places in life. On October 8th, I'm going to pull out some of those things I wrote down that God did in this year that were blessings that relate to us as a church family. The 280 responses to Jesus this year. Come on, that's 280 people have said, pray, pray with me. I want to start a relationship with Jesus in my life. That's what this church is about. That's what our dream was, was for that. I'm telling you, I, I, I never lose the emotion of the impact that when God and humanity come together, I'm telling you, that's the greatest thing in the world. I'd celebrate one. I can't even imagine. It's just an unbelievable. We've gotten to be a part of that. Uh, more baptisms than ever. We're going to have, by the end of today, we've got a few more tonight. We're going to have just over 60. That's a record for our church. It's awesome. Some people were inspired in first service, and they went to starter kit Christianity in the second service. They're in there right now so they can get baptized in February because they're like, I need to do that. I want to do that. I'm telling you, it's awesome. I wrote down that we had a great church conference, that the stage got moved, that we heard from God to launch a Pasco campus in January of 2018. We started the green tent. It was actually a tent at one time, and then it got the wind destroyed it, so we moved it inside, and now it's a green awning tent thing. That's awesome. We gained local elders, and we have a local eldership now for our church with the Phillips, the Borders, and the Moults. I wrote my first book, which I, uh, it's on order now, the edited copy, and it's going to be here in a week and a half, and every visitor that comes to our church is going to get a copy of that and know the miracle stories of how God started this church and where we're going. Uh, 35 interns this year. We took our first international missions trip and went to Uganda, Africa. I mean, that was awesome, you know? And we we're uh, just about to get our 501c3 status uh, because that'll be huge so that corporations and big businesses can just dump all the money they want to on us and we can go, yes, thank you, because our God is good and he told us that things were going to come our way. Thank you for being a part of that. And it's going to be amazing. I'm going to end here uh, with five things that are on this list that are the five highlights I really wanted to share with you today. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Some of you were like, give me some popcorn. You're like, yes, yeah, I just want to get to the good stuff. Number one, um, God has brought some strategic people here. There's a couple that have visited our church three different times and spoke here. A couple from Australia named uh, Grant and Cheryl Wendell, and uh, they've Church planted, they spoke and ministered all over the world. Uh, if, you, if you know Church World down in Los Angeles, there's a very large church named Mosaic, pastored by Erwin McManus. They've served there for the last year. They felt on their hearts that they were to come here and just for free live here and serve our church in any capacity we needed for six months. And then they're going to move on. They just wanted to do that. And they're in the service. It's actually their first Sunday here. They're going to be here for the next six months. I'm going to have them stand. I want you to give them a new vintage hand clap to Grant. And Cheryl Wendell, so glad to have you guys. They have been like coaches and mentors to Lisa and I all along this journey and helped us to get where we're at, and so grateful for them. Second on the list of five big ones is that our worship team is writing songs. Now, this is a big deal. This worship team is writing songs. And uh, we're going to sing tonight, today to close this first song that they've written together as a, as a band, and we're going to sing it like an anthem. We're going to raise the roof. I'm telling you, there's a difference when you're singing some other church's songs and when you're singing songs that were birthed, written, and born out of the, the passion of a certain local church. And man, I'm telling you, it's going to echo in your heart, and it's really cool, and uh, you're going to enjoy that. The third one was this. We were not gifted $100,000. We were gifted $150,000 at one time. $150,000 in one, just, here you go. Listen, 
I've watched a lot of bank robbery movies, but I've never really seen that much money like in a check. I was nervous. I was like, oh, I don't want to get any water on it. You know, take it, you know. I didn't want to cry on it, nothing, you know. And uh, I was like, couldn't believe it. We don't even have a building fund going yet. And somebody saw what God's doing and said, I want to sow some seed into that for the future. People who aren't even here yet. I just went, that's some faith. (sighs) Can I tell you this? That money came and was handed to me on probably the darkest day of 2016 for me. Went through some of the worst things that day. At the end of the night, some good things, you know, happening and uh, whatever. But that was, and I just went home and I just went, God, I mean, just the, you know. I'm telling you that God sees your life. He knows. And he doesn't leave you open-ended. He closes the gap for us. Fourth thing was this. We're doing uh, some very intentional kids' ministry upgrades. If you walk back there, uh, we've repainted. We're moving things around. We're doing a couple things. Number one, we're, uh, my office on Sundays has become the nursing mom's room because we, want to, we, don't have any, we don't have any rooms in this building. And we haven't invested any money into this building because we didn't know if we were investing into somebody else's future. Didn't want to pour too much money into this place. But so we uh, are converting my office is, uh, for nursing moms. So let the word get out that if uh, moms, you know, you got babies, you got a place in there. There's a TV in there. You can watch the football games if you want to. You can just don't tell us the scores, but you can. It's uh, secure, quiet, and uh, we wanted that. We're also going to be adding a kid's classroom because we've got sometimes 30, 40 kids from the ages of 6 to 11 in the one big classroom, and we need to split those up, and so we're going to pull the trigger and make some things happen. If you see Josh, you got to hug that man. He's poured his life out for this church and for those kids, and I'm telling you, he's going to take that thing to a whole nother level. You're going to see it in the next couple weeks, and I want you to just get behind him, and uh, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have, we're going to have the best kids ministry in Tri-Cities. That's what we're going to have. And so uh, it's going to be amazing. Final thing is this, is that a week and a half ago or two weeks ago now, we did finally with AGM signed a sales and purchase agreement for this building. So we're buying this building. That's kind of the big news. So it's really cool. We got it at our price, not their price. And... Uh, it's pretty awesome just to go, God, okay, maybe all these things you've been saying to us all along, maybe we should trust you more. <laughs> He's so good. Now, I, I want to tell you this because it's your church. You know, it's our church. And some of you might go, man, I'm, I'm inspired and I want to sow money into that for 2016 for your taxes or whatever. Some of you uh, might want to do it in next year. I want you to know that in about two and a half months, we have a 10-month window now of fees, feasibility and financing. We've got to go through all those things, make sure that whatever plans we draw up are okay with the city and things like that. So if we buy it, we can remodel it to make it the, the way it should be for us. We are glad that God actually spoke to us and led us to do campuses. Otherwise, it probably would have gone after some big, huge building. might have been too big for us. But we don't want to just have one massive thing. We want to have just church wherever there's people. And so we're glad that this is the first step in that. And uh, probably in about two and a half months, we'll have some drawings to show you and make options available if you want to get connected to that. I I know there'll be a lot of questions, but I want you to know that he crowns the year. He crowns the year. He ends it. You know, when somebody runs a race or when a warrior would go out to battle, they'd come back and oftentimes they'd put a crown on and go, you fought hard, you felt like you were going to die out there, you were scared to death you were victorious, we're going to put a crown on you. And the, that word, I, I really studied this verse out because it so spoke to me. It really means to encircle, to close the circle. It puts the crown on. I'm telling you that some of you have been through a year. You're in a season. And I just felt led to, to pray over you today. Let you know that God's going to close the gap. He's going to bring you full circle. He's not going to leave you hanging. And then the, my favorite part that so resonated with me this year was even the hard pathways overflow. You know, the hard pathways, when you read that in Scripture, if you were to could go back, that's an English translation of what David wrote in the Hebrew language. 
and it would mean the pathways that were worn by the wagon wheels going over and over it made it so hard that you couldn't plant anything from the top because the ground was too hard. And it symbolizes those places in our lives that seem like impossibilities. You go, man, God blesses me over here and on this side, but man, on the pathway I'm on, it's just so hard. But the scripture says this, that God even causes abundance to come on the hard pathways. And sometimes where we couldn't plant a seed from the top because God makes life happen in this planet, the seeds that were planted over here begin to sprout roots under the ground and break through from the bottom where you can't see until the miracle happens. I'm telling you, God's at work in your life. He's gonna break through in areas of your life that you had no control over, that you've tried and tried and tried, but God doesn't just wanna close the circle and crown your year with coming back around and giving you a normal uh, you know, thing in your life. He wants to break through in the hard pathways for you. He's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. He's good. We're going to end here with one story uh, that I want to read to you. There's six glass towers at the Holocaust Memorial in Boston, Massachusetts uh, that represent the six extermination camps where six million Jews lost their lives. Five of these towers tell the story of the unconscionable cruelty and unimaginable suffering. But the sixth tower stands as a testimony to hope inscribed on the tower is a short story called One Raspberry, which is also the name of my favorite band in my head that I, anyway, One Raspberry, written by Gerda Wiseman Klein. Here's what's written in that story, one little part. Elsie, a childhood friend of mine, once found a raspberry in the camp and carried it in her pocket all day to present it to me that night on a leaf. Imagine a world where your entire possession is one raspberry and you give it to your friend. The true measure of a gift is what you gave up to give it. One raspberry isn't much unless it's all you have. And then it's not next to nothing. It's everything. I, I want to tell you that uh, maybe I, I don't know giving records in our church because I don't check that, but I do know there's probably people that go to our church that love our church but have never given anything to it. Maybe you thought it wouldn't count or matter. I want to tell you that it doesn't matter. You know, there might be people in here that can give thousands of dollars and there's people in here that, man, a $20 bill would be just a huge sacrifice. It'd be your one raspberry, so to speak. And I want you to know that anything you decide to give, uh, it, it's when you give and it costs you, God keeps the scores. Your pastor won't know, God will know. And I'm telling you, it's those kind of sacrificial giving moments that God honors. And they're like seeds that go into the ground. And you don't even see what happens to them right off the bat. But eventually, it sprouts up with a fruit that has hundreds of seeds in it. And it just keeps going. This is how God's way of the world works and with money. And I would just challenge some of you that maybe you've never given to consider at this time going, I want to sow some seeds into this field because I believe in it. I think that would be a great thing to do. But beyond that, beyond, this was not a sermon to, to try to raise money. I think some of you, your life is the raspberry. <laughs> and you've got to go, God, I'm going to give you my whole life. I'm going to step out in faith and give it to you. And I'm telling you, if you would not just go to church, but you would let church happen in here. You'd invite Jesus into the temple of your body and live in your life and let him speak into your mind and your thoughts and your actions. I'm telling you, he'll take that and it'll mean the world to him and he'll transform you. He'll work with you.